Dermot Lavery and Michael Hewitt, um, together you are uh, managing directors of Double Band and you've made, as directors and producers in your own right, you've made a, a quite frankly astonishing contribution to the, the documentary film canon. Um, the subject matter that you've explored is as diverse as it's possible to imagine, but there's a common theme throughout which is absolute the pursuit of quality in everything that you've done. Um, can you tell us how you met and how you began working together? Okay, well, we, we're going back to 1983, and uh, I think we were both in a kind of similar situation, you know, not that long out of college or, or uni and looking to kind of get a start in the filmmaking business. And uh, we kind of, I managed to get some work on a feature film that was being shot here freelance. I did continuity and took the, the stills. And uh, Dermot, was, he'd been doing some work in film course in London. And we just kind of met uh, then. And, and we worked in that kind of workshop sector for, for, for a while. Uh, but then that workshop came to an end. And we decided kind of we were happier working on a kind of production company rather than the kind of pure workshop sector, if you like. So we set up Double Band in the uh, end of 85, beginning of 86, and, and uh, that was it. And you were both very young. Thank you know, you were, you're, not now, then, <laughs> you were both very, I mean, early, mid-twenties? Mid-twenties. Mid-twenties. Where, where do you think, I mean, looking back, do you think it was an audacious, confident, bold move? Where do you think you got the confidence from? So many things in life are accidental, aren't they? Uh, I had actually heard about Michael. I, I was, I had finished at art college and gone to London to do some more uh, filmmaking courses, just to develop technical skills and a friend of mine, Colin McGuckin, had just come off working on the film Acceptable Levels with Michael and um, told me about uh, Michael and uh, Alistair Hearn and others who were setting up uh, Belfast Film Workshop in Belfast. So uh, Colin gave me Michael's number and I called Michael and we arranged to meet when I got back and uh, from there on the story started. So you, you knew you wanted to work together, but the idea of creating your own company, perhaps there was a degree of naivety there. You didn't quite perhaps think through what that actually meant. Definitely. It wasn't a decision about, you know, we want to create a company and we want to, it was we wanted to start making some films. And to make a film, you had to have a company. So we created a company. But it wasn't thinking about it in that kind of business sense of we're, we're now creating a, you know, uh, company for growth and whatever in the future. It was, it was the means to start making, making the films. In those days, we didn't think about bed nights and you know, economic outturns and the contribution we made to the wider economy. We just did things. Just did things, yeah. And in that period in the early, mid-1980s, the, the, the notion of actually running a production company was starting to take hold. Um, Channel 4's setting up in 1982 kind of stimulated a whole new generation of production companies across UK, the UK, uh, and it, it stretched to here as well. And there were a number of companies set up here, you know, David Barker's production company, uh, David Hammond's, and, uh, and along with that, there were other aspects of Channel 4's strategy, which was develop, to develop entities into production, television production entities that before that were film cooperatives, and that's where Belfast Film Workshop come from and Front Room that made acceptable levels and Derry Film and Video in Derry uh, and Northern Visions eventually here. So the, that kind of mid-80s period was a period where you were starting to think that it was possible to set up you know, a production entity and that can be small and modest, that can be just based on two or three people wanting to get um, films or, or documentaries made and you know, we thought we could do it and we both had I suppose had um, you know made our bones working on all the people's productions and helping all the people make their programs for films. Um, um, whenever uh, Belfast Film Workshop um, ended or, or we left it, uh, I think then we were compelled to work together to make that happen because what we discovered was that filmmaking is a very 
difficult and solitary thing, and that when you can kind of form a team, it becomes a lot easier when you can kind of sustain each other. And I think that's pretty much something that has survived all the way down the decades. Good observation. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It's, you know, we would have seen, met a lot of people down through the years, lone filmmakers, you know, people trying to get their projects off the ground. It's not easy. It's a long haul. And whenever you're working together, you can just kind of bounce off and get energy from each other and, you know, um, uh, and that, that really worked for us. And now fast forward to, to 2021 and the, the company itself is much larger. Um, you, how many, how many projects would you say Double Band has? What is the, the, the running total at the minute in terms of the number of projects you've created? Oh, Have you counted films? Over the year? Oh, um, Maybe you haven't counted? Haven't counted. No. It's, it's, I'd hazard to guess it's something like 150 or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah. Looking back to the young men you were in 85, 86, 87, what have you learned, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Um, it takes a, a, you know, it takes a few years to, to develop a self-confidence, you know, uh, you know, uh, an idea that, that you're no different from anybody else in any other place that's passionate about making things, so you should be no less and no less able or capable. Um, I think there was something about the history, you know, because when, when we talk about a period when our production companies were only getting going here, in the early 80s, mid 80s, and individuals were only realizing that things could be made. The presumption was that this wasn't a place to make those things before that, that somebody else made those programs, those documentaries, those films, or, or normally flew in to make them. So there was a, a sense of that's not for us. So, you know, it took a few years for us to realize that, you know, we can do this too, and we can do it to a standard too and we can measure ourselves against anybody else, too. So, um, I think had we known that earlier, we might have moved faster. We're very happy that we've been able to sustain that across the year, but when we talk about the number of things that we have made or are making, we're still only a small, you know, in relative terms, we're only 10 people work with us in, in Double Band. It's not huge. But the amount of work that we've made across 45, 40 years, you know, is a lot when you, when you add it all up. And they're usually very different in individual projects, you know, so they amount to collaborating with a lot of different people. So the kind of the ripples of who we've kind of worked with and collaborated kind of really flows out from that. And we start to feel then that we've, you know, made an impact. Michael? Yeah, I, uh... I think what Darren says is, is right, and uh, I suppose if you look back on it, you see, you know, I think there'll always be projects for us that we kind of look at as kind of turning points for us, you know. Um, so, for example, just, you know, with what Darren was saying there, I was, look, I was starting to think back to a film we did in 97 for Channel 4, so it would have been our first commission with Channel 4, and uh, it was a film called Escobar's Home Goal. Uh, but a footballer in Colombia and been murdered after the, the 94 World Cup and it opened up a whole story about football and its relationship with drugs cartels and you know a wider story about Colombia and for us that was a kind of turning point because you know here we were making something that had nothing to do with with here that we as filmmakers could go and you know of course we there's stories here that we always wanted to tell and do tell but you know there's a story there you know well, I think we'd have felt, well, why would you get a company in Belfast to go and tell that story? But we, we got to do it, and I think that was a kind of turning point for us, you know, that we can, we do the stuff here that's important to us here, but there's stories of, of all kinds of hues and colours that we would want to pursue elsewhere. So that was a kind of wee turning point, you know, but confidence in ourselves, but also getting commissioning editors to see in that way as well, you know, that... You know, you don't have to get a company in London to do it. We can do that too, you know, so. I lived in Colombia for a couple of years, working as a freelance journalist. Day in, day out, I recorded Colombia's grim litany of murders and assassinations and wrestled with the complexities of this beautiful but tragic country. But of all the murders I reported, one in particular shocked me. 
the killing of Andres Escobar here in Medellin, just days after he scored an own goal in the 1994 World Cup. I never met Andres Escobar, but I still think about him. Most of all, I think about how a man can die for committing a simple error on a football pitch. Yes, I, I agree with you. There does appear, you know, there are various ways to look at your back catalogue and to analyse it and to, to sort of segregate it. But there is, there is a very strong sense of an international perspective that despite the fact that, for instance, one of your first works, um, an Irish artist in New York was an Irish artist. It was a, a four artists in New York. Mm -hmm. It was looking outside the boundaries here. So it seems to me that you have had a, your 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 field of vision appears to be in t very deeply rooted here in this place and and the issues that arise from this place. But that you again and again pitch widen your perspective, whether it is through the the, the films to do with sport or other issues, you know, really extraordinary life-changing issues like um, the battle with my brain, um, David Beresford. I presume David was a friend of yours. He'd been a, a foreign correspondent. Yeah, you no, we, we'd, know? We, we'd never met him. We, did, we, we didn't know him before that project came about, but he was, um, he was a good friend. David obviously was working for The Guardian and The Observer in South Africa. And as you say, had been here before, uh, working for them during the you know late seventies, eighties, and wrote Ten Men Dead, as you say, about the hunger strike and so forth. But we didn't know him then. Uh, but we had got to know and work with a close colleague of his who'd been the Independence reporter in South Africa, and so they knew each other very well. And then that made the connection uh, for for that film. Because this is distressing me. I am distressed. I want protection. That's what I hired lawyers for. That's why we won an order out of court settlement. Because they've got no grounds to stand on whatsoever. Almost amusing. Patronize, that's the word. She patronizes me. <laughs> the little, little things that in, in life, which one deals with without hardly thinking about, it, become so many big things. And if somebody's cut my water off, it's a complete. That's a disaster for me. And if they don't reconnect it, I'm buggered. That film was, it's a remarkable piece of work. Really remarkable in so many ways. But one small, tiny detail that really struck me was that you are both remarkably absent. You know, there is, you do not tread into the Louis Theroux style of um, documentary filmmaking. And yet, very unusually, Michael, there are two occasions when your voice is heard on that film, where you ask David a question and Ellen, his partner, yeah. a question mm -hmm. at one point. Yeah. I suppose two questions. Obviously, it's a deliberate decision on your part to remain hidden. Um, and did you ask those questions because you just had to? You weren't getting what you wanted, or can you remember? It was just, you know, I mean, that, that, that film, which, you know, David was had a kind of early onset Parkinson's and was planning kind of quite radical surgery and, and brain surgery in, in France, and we were following him through that. You know, the crew was two of us. It was me and David Barker, yeah. and I think we went out to South Africa four times across a couple of years. That you know, between when we started and when David had his surgery, and then also in, in France a couple of times. So. It's just the two of us, and it became our interaction with David was very conversational, you know. So um, you're right; we tend to keep ourselves out. But you know, if if a kind of off mic question, if you need to hear the question just for the purposes of understanding that, that's you know, th that's fine for us, and and that's the way it worked. But you know, I I really enjoyed working on that film with both David, David Parker, and David Beresford, and. You know, because of David's situation, most of it, aside from at the hospital, you know, was filmed in, in David's house in, in Johannesburg. And, 
you know, we could be sitting chatting in the kitchen and then suddenly it would, the chat would get into something, think we should be filming that, you know, and David Barker would just quietly pick up the camera and the transition from conversation to filming was practically non-existent. And that is so clear, Michael. It, it's so, that is so clearly conveyed in the film. You know, the intimacy that, that that is explored in that film. I'm not talking about the actual surgery, although that is you know mm -hmm. quite remarkable in and of itself. But the it's such an intimate portrait of a man at a point of time in his life, which is challenging to say. It. But there's such um, partnership between yourselves, you and David, and and, and David Beresford. It's so clear. Um, are there times when you've, I mean, is it just natural to you that you don't put yourselves in front of the camera at any point? No, no, it's a, it's a very interesting thought because um, well, we had a different view and there are film, filmmakers that we would appreciate who put themselves at the centre of the story. Werner Herzog is a good example. Genius filmmaker, makes feature films and dramas, but brilliant documentaries, but usually puts himself into the documentary, will crowbar himself into it, you know, to magnificent kind of uh, ends. Our view has always been that the story is, and the people, and the subject are what it's about. And that, you know, I suppose it's, we would have similar views on lots of things, you know, but one of them would be about controlling your ego and, you know, and not necessarily, you know, kind of, um, you know, pushing yourself into the story when it's not necessary, when you're not actually part of the story. Um, and that frees you to, to deal with the material in its own rights, on its own terms. Um, and it's not like we set out with a manifesto written to say this is how we make films, but when you look at the sum of the films, that is indeed what, is, what has happened. And so we would have an attitude to all films where we think people who push themselves into the film create a problem for the film, or, or, or the film becomes a manifestation of something to do with the, you know, the filmmaker's ego, the filmmaker's desire to be a celebrity or, or whatever. Um, so I suppose the films then become, you know, a, a manifest kind of, you know, description of what our philosophy is in, in, uh, in making films. Yeah, it's interesting that you should point that out, but uh, it's only when you add them all up that you realise that that's a kind of a, um, uh, you know, it is, it is, an attitude across all the programmes. Mm. And I suppose when you think, you know, to the time when you were beginning in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, a Northern Irish accent, a regional accent of any kind, was a, a, a screaming impediment. It was really extraordinarily yeah. weird. And thinking about Werner Herzog, how awful would it have been if we had been deprived of his spectacular voice? Well, exactly. Unlike any other. He's in Mandalorian, isn't he? <laughs> Is he? Yeah. Right. He is. He's, a, he's in an extraordinary movie with Robin Williams, um, uh, where you, he doesn't appear, but he's, it's, you, you just hear a little snippet of his voice and it drove me crazy yeah. for, for days trying to, oh, it's Werner Herzog, there is no one else like him. I yeah, know, it's very interesting. <laughs> you know, the whole thing about accent is, is fascinating and complex, you know, and you can't um, disassociate that with what we're talking about with, uh, you know, in the 80s, the, you know, the production center, sector here only getting up and going or people feeling that they have the right to be filmmakers if that's what they choose, you know, and people slowly find their voice and find their feet, you know, and great filmmakers like Margot Harkin or, you know, John T. Davis or, or whatever. You know, we were behind the curve and lots of all, you know, on the island of Ireland, on the south of Ireland, there was a lot more, to be a filmmaker down there was to be a drama filmmaker, was to make feature films. That was, if you wanted to be a filmmaker, you wanted to make feature films. Up here, there was a different, there was a different story. And it usually kind of flowed from, uh, from television and documentary and the troubles and, you know, um, the fact that, you know, we needed to process what was going on here. We needed to address it and confront it and, you know, and have our voice heard uh, in it. Um, so I remember when we were, we got very friendly with Stuart Cosgrove at Channel 4, a Scottish man. Um, and I remember he told me a very startling thing. He says, in advertising, um, this would have been 
mid 90s, uh, advertisers would have had a league table of favorite um, narrators to narrate their adverts. And at that particular time, I think it would have been the early 90s, Scotland was at the top and Northern Ireland was at the bottom in terms of accents. So, you know, you didn't hear many Northern Irish accents because the Northern Irish accent was associated with a certain thing. You know, you've got a conflict that goes on for 30 years, then everybody and everything you hear about that place is all about conflict and confrontation. And that then flows out, you know, and that becomes part of our challenge, you know, to change the narrative, change the, in terms of what can and can't be made, what we might be interested in. Um, so it's a complex, it's a complex uh, issue. And so going back to talking about the, the troubles work for much of a much better phrase, I, I, you know, I haven't, it's such a large part of your practice, but it's very difficult to even know where to begin to discuss it. But one thing just on the, the idea that, that your focus, the company focus, could have gone either into drama or documentary. There is a, there's a really strong thread of drama in all your documentaries because you focus again and again on individual personal stories. And you tell those stories the way drama turns, drama filmmakers, writers tell stories. It just happens to be within the context of a, a real life story. Um, Father Alec Reed. You know, 14 days that, I mean, talking about a turning point, an absolute turning point in Northern Ireland. Um, you really took it head on. You appear to have just taken it head on, the fact that we were living in this mad situation in this small place. And you found a way through to tell stories that never feel exploitative and are always 100% authentic. Were you, did you ever bottle it? Did you ever think that's... You know, for instance, um, uh, Christine's children. You know, it's very late into the film when we realise the protagonist's motivation for why he moved to the Philippines, which was, of course, the murder, the death of his wife in Le Mans. Yeah. Um, Is that enough of a question for no, you? No, Sorry. it's not a difficult question. No, yeah. it's, no it's interesting because... Um, it all flows into the same thing and, it, and it, it's connected to voices and it's connected to the decision to stay here to make films and not to go to London or, you know, to, or further afield. So when you stay here, you've, 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 you have an obligation to make a contribution and we have felt that very keenly down through the years, like trying to mo moderate what we do. Um, to make sure that what we do uh, doesn't make it worse, potentially could make it better, but it's good enough if it doesn't make it worse. So telling stories is important, dramatic shape and three act structures and dr dramatic kind of turning points is very important. We want to compel our audiences, you know, but we have, we have our company's called Double Band Films. It's kind of like, you know, it's two people who came together. We come from different traditions. We grew up in different traditions, that, but everybody through a lifetime changes the viewpoint that they inherit. If you don't, then there's something wrong. So we have a lifetime of working together and we've worked out a way to work together. We've also worked out, I think, almost unspoken, it's like the manifesto that we never write. We understand how we should do things, not to make them worse. So that's usually to do with empathy and understanding and acknowledging that there are points of view and that there will be opposite points of view and that there's usually a set of circumstances that leads to a point of view. So you're not mature if you're not attempting to understand that and to deal with it. And you know, if it's in, still in the middle of a conflict, conflict kind of um, driven situation, then you have to make sure that that approach can maybe help in one small way, kind of lead out of it. That's, that's for a long time, that's been our view. And that, is a, that has kind of led to us being very circumspect about being at the beck and call of people who might 
have us make those programs, but make the decisions outside of this place. And I mean network programs and, you know, you know, because people that stay here have a stake, you know, you know, so, so it's really important that that idea that we're not flying in, flying out, and that your only kind of obligation is to get your ratings up or to have a, you know, dr or drama or to create a buzz around something to create conflict to be a shock jock, in other words, to create the story. That has never been our, our, our kind of view. So, bottling it, what, is, what does that mean? Bottling that you don't point a finger, that you don't judge. Um, we have probably bottled it hundreds of times, but only for some other better reason, maybe. I don't know. There's an extraordinary and very small point. I want to talk about women's work separately, but on the idea of not of doing no harm, I suppose, as a, as a medic would say, there's a, a very small thing that happens in women's um, work where Pauline Gilmore, the loyalist um, uh, politician, I think mustn't have been aware that she was being, that she still had a mic on. And she's, you film her and, and it made it through to the final edit where she's telling some young band men members to really give it, blow your brains out, I think is the phrase she uses. I think they were on the Ormer Road. I wonder if they were going to go past the Graham's bookies where they had, that atrocity had happened. Um, and that was quite at odds with how Pauline Gilmore had presented herself earlier in the documentary as a very thoughtful, articulate, moderate, sensible woman. Was that a very deliberate decision to keep that overheard conversation in the final film? I, you know, I can't recall the conversations at, at the time specifically, but um, you know, I think I guess you've got different sets of responsibilities, haven't you? You know, and, and uh, you know, in something like Battle with My Brain, you obviously you know feel above all the responsibility towards David and his family. You know that situation. I think when you're dealing with someone in the public eye and maybe maybe just the calibration changes a little bit and, and you have a, a responsibility to your audience as well, you know, and, and uh, uh, so I, I would think something like that I would categorise as, you know, Pauline, I mean, she never raised it with us, we didn't ever heard, but she might have felt unhappy about that, but, but to have taken it out would have been untruthful I think so so I think it but there are occasions where you know you you do leave things out to not you know to avoid embarrassment to people that is you know has no need to be there there's no need to be there um, and uh, you know I can, I'll not get into the detail but you know there are certainly things and again the David Beresford thing you know that you know you know it doesn't need to be there and it's only going to cause it might entertain some people a little bit, but you know, our greater responsibility in that instance would have been to David. So I guess you're just calibrating depending on the circumstances. Make sure you vote today in Tanamore School. Vote Breed Rogers, SDLP. I'm that infamous woman that's been looking down at you from lampposts for the last number of weeks. There you are. And, and I tell you, I'm sick looking at me too. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hope you'll support me. Is there anybody else here that would need to go down, I wonder? This is Lennon. Get me actual figures at the 10 o'clock. One, the actual numbers. That's the perfect place. Except too easily pulled down. Um, she, this lady's in charge of walks you heard and she wants to go up. I think sometimes when you're handing out a leaflet, people think you're one of the old traditional parties and they almost run, and then when they realise you're the coalition, they smile, think, great. Oh my god. Women's coalition. Women this is the candidate. There you go. That's it. That's done. It's hard to run an election when people are busy taking down other people's posters. So much for democracy. See, there's another one lying there. I think that's the Workers' Party. Clearly the only ones that seem to be staying up are the DUP. Isn't it wonderful that she wants to come out to vote? Didn't she put a lot of the young ones to shame? I think she's just not able to get up there. Absolutely, you're going to vote for it, isn't it?
I'm Peter Robinson's wife. Can we, can we try and maybe walk you? Can we try and walk you and take the chair with you? Come on. Is it the house? It is the house. Hello, how are you? How are you? How are you? Best of luck. I'm sure you do. How are you? You're all wired Are you not going to wish me luck? Because I need it more than you. <laughs> I wish you a very happy day. I love women's work. I think it's a wonderful. <laughs> it's such. But <laughs> it's um. It's such a snapshot. Mm. This. of time and it's not that long ago it was 98 i think mm -hmm. it was yeah. when it was um 97 I 97 think. Yeah, yeah the election 97. so was it in the run-up to um local elections and also westminster elections yeah. so it was prior to, obviously prior to the good friday agreement and it's it's a snapshot of off the chart misogyny in this political pl this place and within these political circumstances rhonda paisley is revelatory in her analysis of the misogyny within the DUP, never mind within her family. Um, and the glorious um, exchange between Brona Hines and Reverend Paisley, um, as she's, it's just, it's just a, I think it's a real service. I think it's really useful for women, young women, women of my age today in 2021, to look back, to have that as a reference point, to remember how far we've come. You know, the men who reveal themselves again and again by the way in which they talk to the Women's Coalition and to other women is revealing, to say the least. What made you think of it? Two white cis men, what brought you to it? <laughs> no, we worked closely with Neil Hockey on it, you know, he was a journalist working here at the time. We probably evolved, the, uh, the, you know, because a lot of the thinking around it was, you know, uh, you know after that much time and how long the troubles had gone on, you know, the thought, you know, what can change the culture here, you know, how can we affect the, so, you know, the, uh, the meditation of some of the uh, contributors in the programme around that, you know, can, can women getting more involved in politics, moving up and out of community politics where they were very prevalent and, you know, had a huge influence, um, change the culture, change the nature of our politics, you know. Maybe hasn't changed it. I mean, we have a, our first and deputy first ministers are, uh, are women, but it maybe hasn't changed the culture because we're still fighting the conflict by and all the means, really. It's, happily, it's political now, um, but it still goes on in another form. So it's still very much a, you know, um, you know, a, fo a form of conflict. Uh, so it might take another generation before that starts to have a, a, an impact where we can see a more mature influence of, of, uh, of, of women in politics here, you know. You know, some would say a bit like Margaret Thatcher, the women that, that, that do enter politics, you know, have to behave like men. Um, so maybe it's not happening at the, for that reason, maybe not happening at the rate we need it to happen to make us better. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, I can't remember your role in, did you shoot it or did you produce it? Uh, so you say directed or producer? Produced and shot, it shot some of it, you know, like on the election days, it was kind of all hands to the pumps, yes. basically, you know, so, so we were split covering different, you know, politicians out canvassing or at the counts and so forth, you know, so, yeah. I just got the sense again and again, um, whoever was behind the camera must have had a moment of, yes, he or she actually said that or they actually showed it. There's even a little shot of, of I think, a very, very young Naomi Long. At Geraldine Rice's um, oh, really? election, yeah, I, I believe so. Go. Okay, I think so. Because I wasn't able to remember what role you'd played, it does go to the fact that you do seem to swap the producer-director roles. Um, I just wondered how clearly delineated those functions were, or whether it's a bit of a Coen's Brothers, where it is a collaborative mess, for one of a and you know, a beautiful mess, um, or whether it is those are quite clearly delineated functions. No, they're not, they're not delineated at all. Okay, happy with the Coen Brothers uh, comparison. <laughs> Uh, no, and that, and that would be uh, an issue. We, you know, we would we see producing and directing as all the all the one, particularly in documentary. You know, 
you know, the idea of a too strict a demarcation is a bit of a nonsense. You know, you have to be acting. If you're directing, you have to be thinking like a producer. Because you think about what's possible and what's affordable, and what's you know how you schedule it. You know, and all of you know, and vice versa. So because we flipped and flopped, you know, together, sometimes we, we would have ended up mixing the rules up. Maybe it wouldn't have been clear who was directing because we would move through the edits in, in, in partnership and collaboration and you know in both having a view on, on uh, we would agree in advance how we go about shooting and something how, you know so it's just about who the camera person is talking to on the shoot it's usually not nothing more than that you know it, I mean it's, it started out I guess with um, you know going back to the first one an Irish artist in New York Dermot had been to art college, he knew some of these artists. So, you know, to do the interviews with them, it just it was the natural thing that Dermot would direct and then I, I produced. But it, as Dermot has explained, the way kind of we work together through, through the edit in particular, you know, so always talking and, you know, and for a long time, you know, when the double band office was one office, you know, you're hearing each other's phone calls all the time, you know, so, you know, we never really had formal meetings because we were constantly just talking about stuff and knowing what each other was doing, you know, and and, uh, and I guess that's why when, you know, in more recent projects like Road or, or Lost Lives, the projects that we felt, you know, a particular kind of thing that we wanted to do together that we kind of, for want of a better term, formalised and said, right, we'll, co we'll go as co-producers, co-directors, you know, but it's kind of an expression of, of what we've been doing anyway. Of course, you know, there's a lot of double band projects not directed by either of us, you know, with a great team of colleagues there, you know, but, uh, but yeah, that's it. So that is maybe the answer to the question I've asked you before, which is how on earth you've managed to, to remain as partners for as long as you have. And it must be because you are together, focused on the same goal, that, you know, in the old style of things where, you know, the, the, the director would be only single-mindedly following the artistic vision and the producer would be thinking about the money, that doesn't apply to that you work together towards yeah. the one goal, which is the best possible project Double Band can make in that particular circumstance. I think, I think that's true. Um, and it comes back to the thing about, uh, you, know, um, you know, the kind of films that we value, you know, the, you know is authorship as as relevant in this context or is consensus more relevant? You know, you know um, I think authorship is good, it's interesting. And, you know, our, our feature film, like when we met, we would have had, you know, Nick, Nicholas Rogue or Werner Herzog or Kubrick or, you know, or Tarkovsky or all. We found that we kind of loved all the same things before we, um, but in the world of documentary, it's really, I think it's very interesting debate uh, around um, authorship and directing and directorship and, uh, you know, it's, our, our way has, has not been that and has been very specifically not been that and it's manifest in, in how we perform, how we relate to each other and how we relate to the team around us. It's never hierarchical, it's always consensus. And, and Michael, you mentioned something there that I wanted to talk to you about, the idea that as the company has expanded and grown, there increasingly are standalone projects under the, the made by Double Band that you would perhaps exec produce, but not produce or direct. That, is there a tension? Have, I mean, does, albeit the fact that you're working with trusted creative partners, you are relinquishing control. Is, has that been problematic? Not, not at all, no. you know, I mean, no, not at all. I mean, we, you know, we have people like Brian, Brian Henry Martin, Johnny Golden, that, you know, who've worked with us for almost 25 years, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so the way we've kind of worked, we feel we work with them, you know, and, and uh, you know, they're very talented people. Um, you know, we come look at it and we, we share ideas and hopefully, you know, we have something positive to suggest and vice versa, you know, so it, it remains very much the same, the same kind of practice that Dermot was describing as the way we have worked is 
kind of extended into our working relationships with, with the team, you know. And we've tended to, we, um, you know, we've kind of retained a kind of core staff for, for many years. There's a lot of people there that have, say, like Brian and Johnny and others that have worked with us for quite some time, you know, so um, we may be a little bit less active than other companies in the freelance world, you know, I mean, we do do it, but maybe not as much as others, you know, where a director comes in, does a project, leaves again, tends to be part of the wider double band team. And so they've, you know, if you spent that long working together, then I guess you do share some of the kind of ethos and, you know. You mentioned that Dermot attended art college. Um, so many of your films explore contemporary art, whether visual art, poetry, jazz, so much, community circus even. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're speaking the week after the Array Collective have been nominated for the, the Turner Prize Belfast Array a Collective of 11 um, contemporary artists who very much are in the space of artists as activists. Um, and thinking about the trouble with art, there was the artists who talked about their practice in that film, it's, it, there is activism throughout it, but nobody actually says the word. I wondered, you're still talking to commissioners about films about art. Has that kind of conversation changed in recent years? I was just struck by how unapologetic the trouble with art was in terms of simply, simply talking to visual artists about their work. There were no fancy gimmicks, there was no, that was it, that was enough to get that film made. Is it still enough in your experience? No, it's not enough and I think um, the trouble with art could be made again today and you would have all the exact same themes and stories and frustrations. Um, a lot of that's to do with the underdeveloped nature of our region, you know, the lack of commerce and and infrastructure and, and strategy to, to develop the arts um, uh, in a long-term way. I think we've been incredibly short-term the way we've developed everything. And of course, the pandemic has made everything so much worse, you know. Um, I remember, and I still, and I, when I watch The Trouble With Art, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by their commitment to the life that they choose. And the life that they choose is a life of making art and a life of penury, you know, and that you have to, that you have to make your living by another means, mostly teaching or state support through Istana or something like that. But commitment to the, to the making of art here is a profound thing. I think, you know, not like a decision in, in other in all our places, of course, there will be similarities to other places. I, I just think I'm incredibly impressed by that group of people when I'm reminded, you know, um, that they're all still making art, you know, 25 years later. They've all lived that life, lived and died as, as artists, even though it, we could have been certain then, and we still know now that it has and is a struggle. Amazing. I mean, let's face it, we live in a really strange society. Um, and I think art, especially the visual arts, um, can play a really important role. There's that doubt that to whom and to how many people and who are the important audience, who are the audience you want to address yourself to. Um, and also, the, I suppose, the, the situation here, that uh, you know, you're, you're in a studio painting or doing whatever, whatever, and meanwhile outside there's all this sort of craziness going on. And... And once art is in there, you know, it's come from the artist's studio, then they're brought to the gallery, which is a marketplace, and we must proclaim that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of artists are a bit like prophets as well, without honour in their own land. We're not much in the way of singers, we're not much in the way of preachers, but we just want to say it and preach it and share it the way it is. A painting is only of value if there's a dialogue with someone else. 
And that dialogue is a very personal one. It may not, in fact, be the dialogue that I have in mind. And it's that kind of dialogue between the spectator and the painting which is of value. Hope these guys have got copyright for what they're filming here, you see. Because we've seen this before. And then they chop it up, you know, and have it that goes on the floor. And then they put it across the way they want to put it across. And they often put across a picture that's not fastened to the true truth and reality as it is. And yet there was a, a, a really, really big lack of self-pity. You know, Mickey Donnelly, God rest him, you know, talked about the pleasure of being a visual artist in Northern Ireland, the great aspects of it. Yeah, they talked about the responsibility. Yeah. But also uh, a great camaraderie and great sense of fun and a partying kind of community. Um, back then and still now, you know, you know that's, that's how these communities sustain themselves, you know, it's a kind of a life, you know, and they, 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 they work together and they socialise together and they kind of sustain each other, you know. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing, you know, but it's not celebrated or it's not manifest in, in the kind of the world around us. We're not coming down with galleries. The people, the public at large, don't value that life choice. There aren't any, there are very few, there are a few, but very few celebrity artists, because that's usually the measure of whether society at large kind of value that as a possible avenue for a young person interested in the creative arts, you know, being a painter or a sculptor. It would still be a curiosity for the most of the public here, you know, and that's what we've got to work on, you know, and that's what the Mac is working on very brilliantly, you know. Um, so, but, you know, all that's associated with stability and economic growth, you know, and, and, and settling of all the other cultural issues around us, the more kind of, you know, historical cultural issues to let contemporary culture kind of float up and above that. That's, that's the thing. I wanted to go on to talk about your latest venture, but just before that, a couple of quick questions. Latest venture? <laughs> Bitcoin. <laughs> um, your top three favourite films, Michael. Top three. I, I'm. Can I dodge that one a little bit? No. I could. I could talk about favourite filmmakers and, and then without, and within that. Then Do you mean some, among our own film? Among, among our own. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, but either or. The the three just of any kind. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Well, I I just instinctively tend to think of drama then of you know feature films as opposed to talks it's just what i started um i mean filmmakers that i've always kind of liked be people like uh nicholas rogue who darman's already mentioned and look at a film they're like bad timing it's just extraordinary uh christoph Koslowski, the whole decalogue series and particularly it's a short film about love the extended version um Going back a little, Francois Truffaut, you know, when I was kind of in my mid, late teens and starting to realise that there's a bit more going on in films here than I realised previously, you know, and, and I just loved uh, uh, Truffaut's films, the kind of tremendous warmth and, and charm and humanity I found in his films, you know. Uh, very, very personal films. But without that sense of ego either, you know, they just, uh, uh, I, I just find them really kind of warm and charm. So something like The 400 Blows or Day for Night or, I just love those. So there, there's three, three filmmakers. That's okay. We'll allow that. We'll allow that. <laughs> yes, realising that things are not quite the way you thought they were through art. I'll never forget the time as a... I must have been in my late teens when I realised that Grace Jones' pull up to the bumper wasn't about parallel parking. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me in cinema, you know, because, you know, as a kid, you know, when you go to cinema and it's a Saturday afternoon or evening, and I loved it. And, but it was actually a Nick Rogue film uh, on TV, actually. So I thought, no, hold on, there's a bit more going on here than a good yeah, story. Yeah, I do, it was Walkabout. Uh, and it was the first film that I, th so it was made I think in 72. I probably saw it on TV maybe two, three years after that, so around 14 or 15. And 
It's the final song. Mm. You know, it's, it's not just telling us a story here to entertain us for 90 minutes. There's, there's more, and, and that, was the, that was the one. Did you ever meet Nick Rogue, Michael? We did. We met him. Uh, we, we, we had an interest in, in a, doing a film with him, a documentary. It, it didn't go very far. He was willing, but you know, it just didn't didn't happen. But in the course of kind of looking into that, we 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 got to meet him at his uh, uh, house in Notting Hill, and uh, we spent about an hour with him, chat because the house was full of these amazing photographs and. Everything, you know, it's just extraordinary. And he was, he was very hospitable and warm and friendly. But I got to tell him a story because um, when I was about 20, and there was a, you know, as I said, the, his films, particularly in the 70s, you know, there's just a string of films there that I, I loved. And, and in one of them, The Man Who Fell to Earth, there was a, a piece of music uh, that I loved, this, this jazz saxophone piece. Um, but there was no soundtrack album. You couldn't tell from the end credits what it might be called to try and go and find it because it was an instrumental piece and so on, you know. And because at this time then by kind of around age 20, 21, and I was thinking, you know, I want to get into this line of work, I had some kind of trade directory. And there was an address for, for Nick Rogue. He was in this directory on an address. So I wrote to him, dear Mr. Rogue, <laughs> I love you, you know, and you know, could you please tell me what this piece of music is? And about two weeks later, I got a beautiful letter back, quite a lengthy letter describing, you know, how, what, what the piece of music was, that it wasn't available because it was done specifically for the film, that it was written by John Phillips from the Mamas and Papas that the saxophonist was Cliff Townsend, Pete Townsend's father, how he played the sax in a kind of breathy way, which was out of fashion, but that he, Nick Rogue, still liked, you know, a really lovely letter, you know. And with the letter was a cassette with that piece of music and a couple of others from, from the film. And uh, so, I, of course, I had to tell him this story. I said, you know, this is, this is what you did for me. To, you know, and he said, I'm surprised I ever did anything as nice as that. <laughs> I'm so pleased to hear that because it's the worst nightmare that someone tracks you down 30 years after they wrote you a letter that you didn't respond to. And they are really, really successful yeah. and you messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. How lovely. Yeah. yeah. Which does sort of bring us on to meeting your heroes. And I know that as um, avowed boys, you do love your sport. Um, and of course you got to meet Maradona. Um, meeting your heroes, as we know, can be a very disappointing and soul-sapping um, exercise. How was it to meet Maradona? And did you, I mean, did you have to control yourselves when, on the first occasion when Diego walked into the room? It was, um, yeah, well, it was a great experience. It was always on the knife edge, you know, because all, all that he and his manager had guaranteed was a one-hour interview. So everything, we were always looking to try and get more, you know, uh, and, uh, and we got it bit by bit, by bit, but you were always felt, as I say, on a knife edge. He was obviously quite a volatile character, so you just didn't know what was going to happen. So we just kind of rode with it for, for a while. But, um, but one of the opportunities to film additional footage with him was when he challenged us as the team the game of five aside. So, of course, we, you know, we played, it was a Saturday evening in Cuba, outdoors, in Havana, just outside Havana. And of course, David Barker, the cameraman and Ronan Hill, doing sound, they didn't play with him. You get footage, not of us, of, of, of him. Um, and we played for about 45 minutes, but, you know, we were, the four or five of us that were playing, you know, we kept looking at him. We played football with Maradona. Diego said, I born in Fiorito, poor, very, very poor. And somebody, 
¿Cómo es? Patea. Shot. Shot my ask. And me, man, eh, me envió. ¿Cómo se dice? Me. Send me. To the, la cima del mundo. The top of the world. Top of the world. And I arrive. Poor area. Shot in my ask. And put me. Send me in the top of the world. The number one. But I don't have uh, people. I'm alone. He think maybe bibliography. I go to the bibliotheque, bibliotheque, library, <laughs> library, and take one book, and I ask, where is the top on the top of the world? Which is the way? No books. No library. I take my way. You know, it's also one of the, the joys of this work. You know, you get a access to people, you get access to situations. Uh, you know, we talked about David Beresford, you know, that remarkable brain surgery. To be in the operating theatre and see this, you know, it's a real privilege. And I say the cameras can be like a, a passport to, to, to situations, you know, that you just otherwise would not uh, get near, and that's a privilege. And sport has been a really important, I mean, you, you, you must just both love sport, yeah? No? Well, I mean, sport, like, is a way of life too, you know, and there are passions and stories within that, you know, and often, sometimes life and death kind of stories within that, you know, so the sport is the context and the framing kind of uh, device usually for very human stories, you know. So it's rarely that we would make a sports film just to celebrate the sport, you know, or to consider it to be sports coverage, you know. So always we're drawn to a story within a, a you know, a sporting uh, context, you know. And of course, one of the best examples of that is Road, you know, the most a really accomplished piece of filmmaking, which had, I don't know if it was a, um, a Maybe they're completely divorced, but Between the Hedges, a good 20 years previously, you'd made a, a shorter film about motorbike racing. Between the Hedges, we made an all little boxing film. So, we, you know, and we went on to make a bigger boxing film later with Wayne McCullough. Um, but the, the two films that we made, Between the Hedges and, and Belfast Boxers, were, I suppose you would call them immersions into a kind of a culture to kind of understand what motivates people in this in this world you know it wasn't they weren't kind of you know we would we would never we wouldn't have seen them as sports documentaries as such but films about people you know and in extreme kind of sporting situations so because we had we had seen you know this place particularly belfast had been associated a lot with boxing so it was something in the nature of the place you know the urban setting and where boxing clubs tended to be and of course, road racing is very much associated with North Antrim and an Ulster thing, and you know has a tradition and a relationship to the engineering culture here. You know, so we saw them both as different aspects of cultural ways of life by another description. So that's why we want to go and just like drop into them and kind of swim around and come back out again. But out of that, we discovered that there were bigger stories. So the Wayne McCulloch film, we discovered this little man from the Shankill was going to be setting off to America, you know, to be managed by an American TV executive. You know, in those days, it was a, you know, it was a developing relationship between television and boxing, and the two become very merged, one in control of the other, boxing just being part of the television entertainment industry, you know. So Wayne was going to be a hard bit part player in that story, and we thought, this is a wonderful story. So, let's, so we told that, that story. Notwithstanding, we stood with Wayne in the changing room just in, in Japan, in Nagoya in Japan, just before he went out to win a, a, a world title. And we were with him before, we were with him at the ringside, and we were in the ring afterwards. Like, the experience was exhilarating.
I'm not scared of the Japanese gun. I know that's the last thing. I'm never scared of it in the ring. But I think this is my whole life now, and this is. I'm going for everything. You can't afford to lose. I've worked so hard for it, and I'm not going to let it go past. I missed the Olympic gold medal, and I'm not going to miss the world championship. I aim to get it. <laughs> And with road, you know, um, whenever uh, Robert Dunlop got killed and Michael won that race, his son, a couple of days later, it's like we had an epiphany. It's like, what is this word? What, what is this? You know, we, it took us a while to understand what it meant. Um, but once we started to kind of, you know, put it together, this is, this is epic. This is extraordinary, extraordinarily unique, you know, there's, there's nothing in any other sporting circumstance we, that we've seen of this nature where it's about literally about life and death and fathers and sons and brothers and grieving mothers and wives and sisters, all in this sporting context, you know, and all in an incredibly exciting and adrenalized context, you know. So we saw that as another opportunity to make something big. And you did. We knew that if we made it in the, in the right way, that if we saw it as a, an epic story, a big story, beyond the parochial nature of it, then people would appreciate it in anywhere in the world, and they have. People have watched it. And in America, it's been on Netflix in America. It's, it's been distributed all across Europe and the world, in Japan and Australia and New Zealand, you know, and, and you know, the experience is always the same. It's a great film. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Given the, um, the, 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 the very uh, interesting and rich theme that runs through your practice of the context within which we work, it's entirely fitting and incredibly poignant that most recently, the most recent work you've created on the theme of this place and the impact the politics of this place has had on countless individuals is lost lives. Um, an extraordinarily beautiful piece of work. September 25th, 1998. Billy Giles, civilian, single, aged 42. Billy Giles took his own life by hanging himself after serving a 15-year sentence for the UVF killing of a Catholic man, Michael Fay, in 1982. Michael Fay had been on his way to visit his daughter at the Ulster Hospital when he was abducted and shot. In a television interview in 1998, following his release from prison, Billy Giles described Michael Fay as a workmate and a friend. He said, the target was a Catholic man, guy the same age as myself. It didn't matter who it was. To me, it didn't matter. Everything went out the window. That's the effect the environment I was living in had on me. It turned me into a killer. When it happened, it felt to me that somebody had reached down inside me and ripped my insides out. It felt like somebody had just put their hand down in through my head 
and just ripped the insides out of me. I was empty. I felt empty. You hear a bang, and it's too late. It's too late then. You've went somewhere you've never been before, and it's not a very nice place, and you can't stop it. It's too late then. I lost something that day I don't think I'll ever get back. Billy Giles said in a suicide note, I was a victim too. Please, let our next generation live normal lives. Tell them of our mistakes and admit to them our regrets. You must be very proud of that work. We, we are, you know, obviously, you know, it's a very special project for us. Um, the book was always in the office as well as at home. And, you know, when we were making 14 Days, the film with Alec Reid or, you know, anything that dealt with the troubles, the, the book was there, something we would turn to, so on, but, you know, we always thought the book itself, you know, was much more than a reference book. And, and of course, on some of those projects, we'd worked with David McKittrick as a consultant and one of the authors of Lost Lives. So the idea was always there to do something on it. But, you know, how do you do a film about a book that is a list of, of killings, basically? Um, so we would talk about it from time to time, talk to David about it, you know, and then we'd I'll go off and do different things, you know, and then we come back to it and talk some more and then go off again. And, you know, I think anniversaries you know, can be overdone, I think, sometimes, you know, but nonetheless, we realised we were approaching the 50th anniversary of the start of the Troubles, uh, which, as we said, was obviously going to be the most significant anniversary in, in our lifetimes. So we th so that kind of focused our minds and said, OK, let's not go off and do the other thing, let, let's, let's decide how we can, how we can do this. Um, and we came up with, with the approach that we then took and met the other authors, you know, along with David and got their blessing to, to do it. And yeah, you know, we, I think it was about three years in the making, probably three or four before that, and, and talking about it. I, I think the biggest relief for us is, you know, when you delve into that kind of subject matter, that territory, you know, the, the danger of what you were talking about earlier, you know, about do no harm and the prospect for, for doing harm or other people seeking to do harm with what you have done and which you don't have total control over, you know. So all we could do was try to do it and make it as robust as we could, you know, how we went about it. Um, and working closely with the authors, and you know, because we, the book is complete, it's everybody. We had to make selections, and I suppose that's the point at which you could, you know, uh, you probably most open to question, you know, why this and not this, and why this and that. So, I think the biggest relief for us was that um, it was, people responded to it the way we hoped. They would. Uh, no, I don't get obsessed with Twitter stuff and all that, but nonetheless, sometimes you see, you know, how people are reacting to, to something, you know, and when it was broadcast. Well, of course, first it, it had its run the cinemas here, and it was, you know, just a, you know, such a um, great feeling for us, you know, that because QFT, I think 
initially booked it for three or four nights, you know, and, and we had the first night on the chat with yourself, and and then they it just they kept extending because it was selling out, selling out, selling out, you know. So so for that to be happening in in Belfast, you know, that was you know that people were were going, and we got. We kept hearing anecdotally from people, you know, that the reaction at the end of the film was kind of what... There was a kind of silence at the end of it, which actually was the right kind of thing, I think, you know. So, so having been, you know, anxious about, you know, the, the potential pitfalls, you know, or, or you know, um, it, yeah, it... it people responded to it the way we hoped. That, that transition where, where, where a, a perfect artwork, um, a book or a poem or a, a piece of artwork is um, translated into a different art form is, is just astonishing to observe as a non-artist. Um, the creativity involved in reimagining something which is complete, as you said, Michael, in and of itself. Dermot, can you remember, was there was there a thing or was there a moment where you thought, that's it? It's, it's the, the music or the voiceover or the images. Can you remember the evolution of how you arrived at, that's how we're going to do it? I think we, we, we always had a fairly clear notion that it uh, had to be symphonic. It had to be like going to a concert, like going to music where you can't, you know, where you're, you're immersed in it. Um, and experiencing it rather than you know being told the detail of something that that the sum of the sum of the parts was going to leave you with a sense of the whole and I think that's what the book does when you look at the book and the book's closed and you, and you kind of look on it and reflect on that it, it's all in here you know this is the sum of the grief you know coming out of the troubles you know how did, so how do we find you know in, in an hour and a half you know a version of that you know, can never be the book, but it's a version of that that um, encouragement to to meditate about it all. What does it all mean? How can we, you know? So it was it was our small contribution to that because we we do feel and we don't want to make many more of the on this kind of subject because we do feel that this place is now moving to another phase and it, it's going to be a difficult phase, you know, um, you know truth and justice that, you know, we see it all around us every day now, you know, pe people are, st st people are still trying to get through it, you know, so it's, it's, uh, we need to be very careful about the contributions we make into that space, you know. Um, so we were clear that we wanted to stick absolutely to the words in the book, not, you know, that we couldn't veer from that, you know, it should be an absolute representation of that but that we were, should allow the words then to kind of come up and out of the book and start to feel like everybody spoke, spoke with one voice and how we might do that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're corralling a whole lot of other great people to kind of play their part in this too, you know, the actors, the composers, the, you know, the, the photography, you know, the editing, you know. Um, we just got to make sure that everybody's kind of contribution you know, flows in the same direction that we had had planned. You know, but we wouldn't. It, it wouldn't be anything if it didn't have those brilliant contributions. You know, it, uh, like particularly the music. Which you know, it's you know, which took us the guts of a year to kind of work on in many different phases and stages. Um, because if the if the music didn't work, you know, then it was going to be tricky. You know, because it's the music I think that really takes us takes us away, you know, and at the end of every sequence takes us away, you know, it allows you, I think, get a process, the, you know, the, the story we've just been told emotionally, you know, you're kind of, you're in a way that most documentaries don't have the time to do, to, to kind of, you know, gestate a wee bit, you know, to kind of, um, you're usually kind of rattling on in the story, you know, we wanted a way to, you know, that each, each story would be allowed to kind of settle think and, and then move on, you know. So it's... Yeah. You said something that I kind of hadn't really thought about before because, you know, the, the book, the book and the film are 
very, very different, not just the fact that the book's conflating with the mixed selections, but, you know, the book, the language, you know, it's so neutral, you know, it is, this, these are the facts, and, you know, there's no attempt in the book to, you know, for want of a better term, you know, I don't mean manipulate, but, you, you know, to, 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 so, yeah, or to work, you know, but the, the film does work in it, you know, the, the way the actors deliver the lines, the way the music is, you, you know, it's, it is seeking to provoke a response in a way that the book doesn't, in its detail. But what I was just thinking, which I hadn't really thought of before, is what maybe the, the film hopefully can, is what the book as a totality means. Do you know, if you read an individual entry, of course it will move you, but it doesn't set out to, to do that. The, you know, the, the author's made a clear decision not to do But there's something about the totality of the book, just the whole of the book, in a sense. And that has an effect on you, you know, just what the author's saying is, here you are, this is it. And that, that's, that provokes a reaction. And I suppose the film is trying to, if you know what I mean, that it's trying to mirror what the, the whole thing represents. Whereas we were treating the individual words in each entry, we were, you know, we were using music around that. We were encouraging a delivery from the actors that really, you know, would have an effect on people in a way that the book, they weren't trying to do it. But as I say, there's something, I think the authors knew that Oh, there you go. That that is the way that they provoke the response. It does its own work, yeah, yeah, yeah. just by its yeah, sheer yeah, presence. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I think, one of the one of the things that I find one of the things I find most impressive about the film. And um, the the way you experience the book is is as a reference. You know, it is it is devastating to read aspects of the book. But you can, it's too much to read in one sitting. You, you, you reference it and you move away. You had us for 90 minutes and it could have been awful as a viewer. It could have been a dist- It could have been much, much more too difficult and not, not in a healthy way. And the music allows there to be gaps for, for the viewer to regroup, to try to breathe before. I mean, it, it didn't feel as relentless as it may have done, it was. Yeah, I think it's, so. It's very successful, I think. I think that was the biggest challenge, and the you know, was that getting that kind of pacing and rhythm because you know, and, you know, when you needed to step back and when you, you know, and just, and just get to that right, I think was probably the trickiest part of the, the edit. Mm. But funny enough, it doesn't sit outside some of like that, that favourite kind of structure that we like, which is about like you know that two thirds or three quarter way. You're looking for the turn, the twist, the you know to subvert the descent. You know, it's to kind of you know, when are we going to pull out of this kind of moment? You know, which is you can see it in a number of our things. You know, in 14 days, it's very clear because we both remember uh, the story in 14 days. I remember it. I remember having a terrible family row. Um, that there was a series of of steps and a series of events that m- made everybody feel that we were heading to oblivion, we were heading to civil war. How, how is this going to be stopped, you know? Um, it, it did stop eventually, but it was this other thing going on, this secret activity, this secret, these secret peacemakers were at work, you know, and that there was a turn, turning point. And, and I think we, had, we sort of imposed that a little bit on, on, on Lost Lives. We kind of looked for the wor- words, the hope in this, you know, and it's comes in, it comes in one place. And, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the turn that comes around when people want to be seen. You know, you know what the part of the film, but want, want people to be, someone wants to be understood why they did something. And why they think they might do it differently if they were to do it again, you know. And that's if you if you understand that, if you if you empathise with that, you know, it changes your whole view of everybody's part to play, you know. But we, we don't have that luxury quite yet, you know, because we're still, as I say, we're still fighting it by all means. And I suppose that's why I um, 
I am so full of admiration for it. And also for 14 days, you know, as a, as a mother, as, as a, a, a citizen of this place who has, as you have chosen to stay, made a conscious decision to, to seek to do no harm and to try and um, make some kind of positive change. Having children whose ages span from um, 23 to, through to 16, so 23 means that the, the firstborn was born in 98, the year of the agreement, to try and convey to that younger generation what it is that we have come from in a way that helps, well, will perhaps stop it being repeated. I think 14 days and, and uh, Lost Lives do an enormous service in that ongoing work, I, th I feel. But our contribution is only modest. It's only, it's only modest, you know, when you think of the people out there who are really doing the work, you know, people, you know, I mean, work real kind of, you know, like in the streets. Um, but we're making a, a two-part kind of programs now, which, you know, not kind of, so it's a, it's a story about the, um, the, lead up, the lead up to partition, but the only contributors in the programs are, are historians. And these are the people who have been hiding in plain sight for a generation, learned people in the universities, you know, who aren't, you know, whose voices would who can kind of explain the context to us, explain the steps and stages, how and why we got where we are. And once you know that, you know, once you have a historian's kind of view, you kind of think, well, it takes the whole gun smoke out of the, uh, you know, you start to understand the nature of the conflict, how we ended up here is always a step towards it, you know. So this program these, that we're making, you know, we, that we decided we're only going to have historians in this. That's only, that's, you know, and these are people that we just haven't heard from. You know, apart from, you know, appear on a news line or whatever, we need to hear more from these people. These are the people that can explain, you know, how, how we ended up where, where we are. And I think just recently during lockdown, you've moved into, is it your first feature drama? Um, it's not the first. You really had an eye for me that day, didn't you, Tom? You really had an eye for me. And you made me laugh. Remember that one, Tom? You left me shortly after it was taken. Left me for your beloved. She wrote, you know, she wrote me a letter to try and explain, she said. Said she hoped I'd understand. Stupid bitch couldn't even spell. I thought I'd hear from you, Tom. <sighs> what a fool I was. Still Life, uh, the short film that we made in 1998. Um, that was a juncture in our possible development as a production kind of company. Um, and there's a lot to say that we, we should have gone down the drama route then with conviction. Um, but we were, we were quickly drawn to the, the reality of being able to kind of, uh, you know, um, get good business out of Channel 4, making sports documentaries. Well, I think you told us, that you told me that it was, a, it felt like a fork in the road and you had still life and then you also had the option, you'd, yeah. you'd made Escobar's own goal. That's right, that's yeah. true. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were forks in the road and, um, you know, the fork we chose at that moment was, uh, was to go down that, you know, documentary route and to, and to try and get more work from, the, you know, the UK networks. Uh, and our relationship was good with Channel 4, so we wanted to pursue that with conviction. But the, the drama thing was planted there, you know, and, um, you know, it's funny when Michael talks about his favourite films, they're all dramas, they're all feature filmmakers, you know, and that'd be a bit the same. And, you know, maybe that, maybe we make our documentaries with dramatic kind of structures and uh, shapes, um, but maybe it was inevitable that, you know, given time, because it's, you know, that period, late 90s, you know, was a period when it was still 
tough to get films made here, drama films, feature films. It hadn't quite bedded, we, you know, the, uh, the support from government, the Northern Ireland screen structure wasn't up and running yet. Um, so it was, that was still a challenge. I think some would say it's still quite a challenge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the situation then was so, so much different. I mean, the, the prospect of, you know, keeping the company going by just going down, you know, a kind of drama development route didn't seem feasible. Northern Ireland screen, I think we had a, probably at that time an early, uh, you know, incarnation of it. it was maybe the Northern Ireland Film Council or something at the time, which maybe had a little bit more of a kind of cultural brief than an industry, but you know, so it, it, you know, there's no comparison with what was going on then and what is happening now in, in, that, in that world. Never easy, of course, always difficult, but it kind of felt impossible almost at that time. So when I talked, I think I meant the first, is it your first full length? Our latest drama enterprise has been an Irish language feature film, Indian, uh, A Storm is translated, uh, written by Ashley Clark, directed by Damien McCann. Um, low budget Irish language feature film, murder story set in an island off the northwest coast of Ireland. Uh, it's, it's actually a great story and we're very pleased with the way it's turning out. But it was a challenge to make because we made it during the kind of worst months of the pandemic second kind of wave. Um, so that was a bit of an existential challenge just getting through that, you know, and the fear of, uh, of you know, infection or, you know or, uh, you know, the, the, the public health issues that are around that, but we got through it and got through it with a lot of help from, you know, the likes of Northern Ireland Screen and, and working out protocols and how things should be made. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an important piece of work for us and we'll, we'll um, you know, when we finish it, it'll, it'll, it'll prove something else, whatever that is. And is it being cut at the minute? It is, it's yeah. just been post-produced at the moment. Okay, and you're happy? Very happy, yeah. Breach Brennan's in it. And Breach Brennan's... Breach narrated one of your other earlier yeah. films? It's done... You know Breach a lot. Yeah, yeah. Breach... Uh, yeah, I've known Breach... Oh, well, right back to the start. The, that first film that I got a job on was directed by Breach's husband, you know, so of course, way back, so it's 1983. And she's narrated a handful of our docs over the years, yeah. Did yeah. we ask you about your favourites? Top three films? No, I was just saying there that it was interesting that uh, all Michael's favourites are all feature films, and yet we spent a life making documentaries. And we would ha I could have many documentaries that would have been influenced, and documentary makers that would have had an influence on us. You know, because it's much about people that, people that influence you. You know, when we were starting out, people like Bill Miskelly and Margot Harkin and David Barker, all kind of people in our in our circle, you know, who would have been either examples or just people that you admired, you know. Um, John T. Davis, of course, you know, it's, he was already a well-known filmmaker by that time, so it's, it was kind of maybe less about the films, but more about people of conviction and, you know, kind of solid people, you know. Um, so I'd probably choose a, a feature film as well, though. But, you know, being an art school kind of boy, it's going to be, you know, something like Tarkovsky. Because if you're talking about a moment, you know, I do remember uh, going to see uh, Andre Tarkovsky's film Mirror in the QFT. And Stephen and I ta were talking earlier on about the importance of the likes of the QFT and its proximity to the university and young people and how important it's going to be for also university in this area to have a film centre where young people can get that early experience of seeing, you know, important films, you know, so they get used to the idea of consuming that kind of film, you know. If you, could, if you don't get that early, you never get it. It's always an alien kind of world, you know. So I remember going to see uh, Mirror, Andrei Tarkovsky's Mirror in the QFT when it came out. Michael Open, who was the brilliant programmer at um, the QFT, um, you know, always brought in films that, uh, that really were extraordinary and kind of part of that international 
body of films and auteurs that were out there at the time, like Truffaut, Tarkovsky, you know, Hertog, you know, and these things were extraordinary, exotic, wonderful pieces of work, you know. Mirror was one of those films where, you, where I remember having a sort of an out-of-body experience, you know, in, in one scene which is where, where you just think, oh, what is that? You know, that experience where image and sound and dialogue and performance all have some sort of effect on you and you're kind of floating for a day or two wondering, trying to untangle what it was about, you know. You're showing what's possible. So and what's possible, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a sort of an alchemy thing, you know, and only geniuses kind of, uh, you know, really. Um, you know, Nick Rogues and our, Michael talked about, was an our filmmaker. He often had that, his films often had that experience, you know, where it was the alchemy of the combination of all the elements in filmmaking that, um, that, that only, only the instincts of such filmmakers uh, help them understand that when they do this thing, this is the effect that it's going to have. You know, they're, they're kind of rare and rare experiences these days to have that kind of thing, you know. And so when we're talking in 2021, we're looking forward to the creation of what's currently called the Belfast Film Centre in what's currently called the Belfast Destination Hub. And the, I think from memory, it's due to open in April 2027. Um, do you look forward to that, that kind of development? Is that a positive move forward? And I screen very closely involved in it. And um, the idea of a, a centre for film that will speak to young people who want, I mean, Richard Williams, our, our good friend, and, and I screen talks about the Belfast Film Centre performing a function for, for young kids in Northern Ireland who sort of want to have a career in film and, and this is the place they'll go. And then if a Chinese um, investor wants to poor investment into to Northern Irish film, that's also the place she'll go. Um, does that strike, does that resonate with you? Do you think that sounds like a good idea? Imperative. I mean, it's like, you know, no, no self-respecting city isn't going to be without that kind of a film centre, you know. Um, it's long overdue, it's sort of depressing that it's going to be six years away still. That's six years of potential kind of loss of generational kind of influenced by, by that kind of an entity, because I have no, no doubt when that happens, it'll have an incredible effect, you know. It's an important measurement for us, you know, of, uh, you know, being a mature society, you know, because with that comes all sorts of influences from without, you know, kind of, you know, it's a bit like the arts, you know, international arts and international visitors to this place. And, you know, ironically, there was a, an encouraging kind of trickle of those kinds of people coming here all through the troubles. People coming here partly because they were curious, but like going to Jerusalem, whatever, they're curious about what Belfast was like, you know. So you did get some of that, you know. But films and international films bring that by their nature, don't they? You know, you know, we don't have enough of that. You know, that's what we need here to kind of flush out the, the stale air that we've been having to live in for too long now. Couldn't agree more. Maybe we'll have a, um, a double band retrospective in 2027. That might be part of the opening program. <laughs> Not yeah. that I have anything to do for, with it. For the insomniacs. <laughs> <laughs> um, just finally, do you have regrets? Are there, sh are there shots that drive you nuts that you wish you could go back and change? Are there opportunities that you almost where you almost got hold of a, a project or a partnership that slipped away? There's always going to be projects that you can look back that didn't, didn't happen. I mean, part of the, it's curious because part of the process, I think, is, <clears throat> you know, learning when you have to move on and, you know, go on to something else, to let go of something. But at the same time, there's also merit in saying, I'm not going to let go of this one, you know, and it's important to do that too, you know, so you have a little bit of a attention there. So there are projects that, you know, we, we still have very much on the kind of back burner that, you know, if we were seeing her, you might say, well, we should have let that go some time ago, but there's part of us that, no, we're, you know, this is one we're not letting go of. Uh, so there's, there's always projects like that. But, uh, you know, I can think of, 
two or three, maybe not very interesting to talk about projects that didn't happen, you know, but I can think of, of you know, a couple at least off the top of my head, you know, that was thought, well, that, you know, it's a, it's a pity. And one of them was made two, three years later by somebody else. And I, could, I couldn't bring myself to watch it. <laughs> I just knew it was going to hurt too much. So there's always, there's always that. But, uh, As Gore Vidal says, a little piece of me dies every time a friend succeeds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and Dermot? I know. Well, yeah, there's going to be, there are going to be things, aren't they? Um, I think Michael's right, though. That, you know, there are, you know, you know, when you talk about the sports, you know, we're white men, living white middle-aged men. Uh, you know, there are things, you know, there are, there are big issues out there, you know, a lot of it's about race and sexuality and, um, uh, you know, and, you know, the themes that, that uh, flow through our films and programmes are fairly narrow um, to do with our experience. Uh, life for people here are going to, is going to change, I think, over the coming years, you know, um, as we diversify and, you know, different cultures come here and, you know, we start to challenge ourselves around issues of race and colour and, and um, authority and um, access, uh, diversity, equality, all, all of these things, you know. Um, so you're trying to kind of challenge yourself with the with the projects that you develop to see if you can um, make that part of our development too. Uh, it would be a regret if if we didn't get to, you know, because we're probably at a at a stage now where we, we it seems we can get things made, and you know. A lot of them at a low level, but we can get things made, and we've made enough to be able to make the case for all the things to be made. So it is just about determination, then, you know. And the, you know, because media and outlets for films and documentaries are so vast, there's usually a place for the story that you want to tell. It's just whether you've got the energy to keep banging that drum. Do you still think that it's worth doing or making? And there's a few things that we're, you know, we think are still worth making and that we shouldn't give up on them. You know, we will find another advocate. We will find another outlet, you know. Um, and there's a few things, you know, that have happened and been finished as at the end of a process like that, you know. And when you get to the end of it, you really feel satisfied that we, that we you know, um, you know, because the likes of Road, for example, you know, um, was a struggle. I mean, it was a struggle to convince people that, that that should be made and at the scale and in the way it, it was made in the end and that it should, as part of its making, it should be ambitious to go to the world. You know, that was really hard because, you know, so much of the structures that we work through here are about making local, showing local, or uh, maybe the, the, you know, the, the only version of local is the UK, but not beyond that, you know. But when you have to, when you want to think beyond that, then you've got to think about the whole funding structure, how you set it up, how you you know build relationships with distributors, and that means compromising your relationship with the people who only want to show it local, you know. So there's a tension, you know. Um, uh, so that was a long fight. We would have regretted it had we not had that fight and convinced those people that this can go beyond this place, you know. But like profound regrets, I don't have too many. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you on behalf of um, the art sector here for um, continuing to bang that drum around the, the legitimacy of our stories and our work having a much broader perspective and potential impact beyond the local, which is in, in and of itself is also incredibly valuable. But I think so many of us here in Northern Ireland are interested in connecting far beyond whatever borders we observe or don't observe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it hadn't even occurred to me that there might be an option that, 
that you wouldn't have the energy to continue your work. Mm -hmm. um, the thought of there not being double band films for decades to come is, is unthinkable. Um, I've had great fun talking to you today. Um, thank you to the Belfast Film Festival for this fantastic opportunity to preserve forever your sage words and thoughts. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you okay. so much, Mike Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.